Welcome back to the Open Water Talk Show, where we bring in a world of interesting ideas, thoughts, and skills to the members of Open Water. My name is Chris Albrecht, and I am your host, and I am thrilled today to be chatting with Laura Pauly. She is the founder of Feed the World. And I got to tell you first, before I begin, like as a Gen X kid, when I hear Feed the World, my immediate knee-jerk reaction is to yell, <laughs> uh, let them know it's Christmas time. Um <laughs> Uh, per the old Band-Aid song. Uh, anyway, Laura, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. So today we're going to talk about ripples of impact. And I think that's really yes. uh, an important subject at this particular time. What we First, let's just define it. Give me, what does ripples of impact mean? So, um, you know, we, we know that image, you throw a pebble in a, in a pond and the ripples go out. And the same thing is for 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 activism for helping you know to break break down activism it's just it's helping and and i saw that up close and personal for the first time uh really uh working with ukraine and once i saw how impactful those ripples were and are continuing to be um i i was hooked um it it you know we do one little thing and then we see how it how it amplifies and 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 it's remarkable I think that's a great starting point because today's discussion is going to be around how, you, you know, you, anybody can have a small, you know, can make a, a small actions have big impacts. And so we're going exactly. to be talking today about sort of philanthropy and activism and how anybody can do it and access it. But first, let's talk about your journey to becoming sort of an activist um, who has done work in Ukraine, done work with World Central Kitchen, right? Like the, your, your, your CV is a, a wonderful journey through uh, <laughs> all sorts of areas, but give us a little bit of your bio and how you became sure. this sort of accidental activist. Sure, um, very accidentally. I am, um, you know, I've been in high tech. I grew up in the Bay Area. I, I've been in high tech forever. And um, when the the dot com implosion happened, I sold everything I owned and went to cooking school. And uh, my goal was to be a big chef in New York, you know, feed, feed millions. And, um, and uh, that didn't quite work out. Um, so I uh, came back, got back into tech and it really wasn't until um, 2000. And ironically it was COVID that <laughs> COVID saved my life. Um, and I, I just, I went back to my, my natural instinct. So as soon as we were in lockdown, um, I had been, I was living alone and I'd been really sick. I, I think I had COVID way before COVID was known and I'd been really sick for about a month. And so I, I hadn't seen anybody. And then all of a sudden I had locked down and I just panicked. And I thought, We've, I've got to get everybody. I've got to see faces. I've got to hear voices. I have to make sure we're all okay. And so I put a note out on Facebook and I said, everybody jump on this Friday Let's all get together, bring your fav favorite beverage of choice, um, and let's all just check in and make sure we're okay. And um, and I think we had about 65, 70 people that night. And it was, you know, the very beginning of Zoom. And um, and that quickly turned into Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning, free cooking classes. And I did that for about three months. I was still working full time. I did that for about three months. And um and it, it was just, it was so powerful. Just, you really saw the power of community coming together because these people were showing up every weekend and they began to know each other. And you saw, you saw friendships form across the Zoom window. So, um, so that was, that was a, that was a major step. And then that, that um, late summer, we had those horrific fires here and um, the lightning fires, the glass fires. And I had, and by that point, it was my turn to be laid off. So mid-August mid of 2020, I went and volunteered with World Central Kitchen uh, at the uh, lightning fires and then subsequently the, the glass fires cooking for first responders. And that was really the first time I had seen up front the impact of one-to-one -one, um, help. Uh, you know, I'd always, I'd marched, I'd postcarded, I'd phone banked, I'd um, I'd done my, my day at, at um, Glide or um, those other places on Thanksgiving, but uh, to really um, to be there handing people food who just lost everything they owned, and you know some of them were my friends up in Napa. It, it was so impactful. 
so I continued to do that. And, um, and then in uh, February of 2022, when Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, one of my colleagues from, from World Central Kitchen, and this is just the craziest story, he, uh, he was trying to reach people to go over and help, couldn't, couldn't get a hold of anyone. He got on a plane, flew to Warsaw, and followed uh, World Central Kitchen on social media, found them on the border, and helped them set up the kitchen there and stayed and cooked for about three or four weeks. And, uh, and so I was in touch with them the whole time. And so that was, that was what got me over there. That really, that was so impactful hearing, hearing their stories one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, he had brought me into a chat group and one of the women in this group who was also a World Central Kitchen volunteer, all the volunteers were in this one group. Uh, she uh, sent out a chat saying, hey, does anybody want to help me pay for this family of seven go to Edinburgh? Uh, it'll cost, I think the total cost was four or $500. Um, they need to relocate. They've just, you know, they've had to flee their home. And so I jumped in and said, sure, I'll help. And so that was really um, the beginning of the, the true activism in the sense of the word. And that's really what, what led to Feed the World. And so for the next four months, she and I just partnered on uh, whatever, she was boots on the ground. And whenever, uh, and she was constantly meeting uh, Ukrainians as they came over the border, whether it was at the border or in the refugee center. And she'd call me up and say, I've got this family, they need a hotel room for two nights, or I, this family needs train tickets to here, or this family needs to buy clothes, this family needs toiletries, they have nothing. Because um, you have to think these people came with everything they they own in a in a shopping bag sometimes, and you know I have so many pictures of that. But you know these people had nothing, and 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 to be able to send just such a small amount of money to us in the U.S. to make such a massive impact on lives was um, really hit me, and that's that's why I talk about these ripples of impact. You throw a little stone, and it has such a huge impact on people's lives. I want to get kind of granular for a second first, right? Because World Central Kitchen obviously is a pretty amazing organization. They set up really quickly in places around the world. And I'm always like, oh, that would be a great place to volunteer. But I don't know how to cook. And, no, you know, so I don't feel like I have a sort of skill that I could offer them. How does one start working with World Central? Like, how do you get into World Central Kitchen? And what do you need to sort of be accepted and part of that? If you can make a sandwich, you can volunteer. <laughs> that's all. That's all you need. I can do that. To do you can. Everybody, we all can. Um, you know, cooking is such a small part of World Central Kitchen. Uh, it's such a massive organization. Uh, in Poland, I think there was fifty volunteers at any given time, and maybe a few of those were actually cooking, and all the rest were making sandwiches, um, packaging food. Uh, we made five thousand sandwiches a day. The um, we had the hot side and the cold side, and the hot side we were making the soups and the the ten, we made ten thousand meals a day, and um, but we also made made uh, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of gallons of soup. We made thousands of uh, salads. We made um, uh, uh, cakes. We made a couple of hundred sheet pans of cakes a day, and you know everything had to be cut up and packaged. And um, you know we made vegetarian sandwiches. We made salami sandwiches. And when we made the sandwiches, you'd have to, we had 10 slices of salami and you had to put them in the shape of a flower. So everything was made with love. You didn't just throw down the meat. You placed it like they said, like the Ukrainian flower. And so everything they do, they make with love. Um, something as simple as a, as a um, salami sandwich. So, um, you know, we need, they need people to deliver. Um, one of the things I did in the, in the glass fires, um, they needed somebody to help deliver one day. And so we just filled up my car with, um, with meals. And I just went around and delivered them to the hotels where people had been evacuated to, to the shelters um, and, and, and handed them. And it's just, it's, it's so meaningful and um, to really help somebody directly. It's so different than, you know, for 20 years, I've been marching and postcarding and, and um, phone banking and, um, you know, doing these, these things that weren't direct contact and, uh, and to do something where you 
help somebody one to one. Um, it's it's really it's it's so powerful. And so if you can make a sandwich, you can volunteer. Um, you can go to the food bank and 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 give food to people as they come through. Um, Northern California up here, in Marin San Rafael has an incredible food bank, and I've done that before. And they line up and you hand people boxes of food and. You're, you're, it, it's that one-to-one -one contact where you're helping fellow human beings um, at such a low point. It's, um, it's quite profound. I just want to hang on World Central Kitchen for one more second, just oh, because sorry. it's something that I've always heard about, but I've, you're the first person I've met who's actually been a volunteer, especially a volunteer in a war zone, actively helping mm -hmm. people. And I'm just wondering, just like as thinking about it, do you like do you have to bring a tent? Like, how do you like, because once you're over there, do you, do you pay your own way over there? And then do you bring a tent and a sleeping bag and all of your own, those kinds of logistical things? And then you're just working all day. Can you just give me a sense of what that is like, especially sure. in a, in a, an area where you are presumably, I mean, you're not probably, you weren't in like a, you're in a war zone, but not like under heavy fire or anything like no. that. I mean, so, no, we were we were right. Um, we were in Poland, just a few miles in from the border. So, uh, you know, if there was an, uh, you know, a rogue, a rogue missile, we we were in danger, sure. but we really weren't in, in danger. Um, the way you work with Rural Central Kitchen is you go on their website and you fill out a form to be a volunteer and just keep checking the website. If you hear of a, a, a natural disaster in your area or somewhere you can get to. Um, you go on and they'll list where, where and when they need volunteers. And there's, there's cooking and they call it cooking and distribution, culinary and distribution and distribution is driving. It's delivering the food. So if you can deliver food or if you can make a sandwich, um, just sign up and, and that's all you have to do truly. Um, and they need, always need people. World Central Kitchen wouldn't exist without volunteers. It's a very lean organization. Um, very few full-time employees. It, it really, truly depends on volunteers. And so um, if if you happen to be there, if you can get on a plane and, and get anywhere near a disaster zone, um, you do have to pay your own way. They don't pay for anything. Uh, I had to pay my own way. I paid, um, when I went to Poland, I, you know, we all had hotels and apartments and I was there for two months. So I got an apartment um, and I had raised money. I can talk about that in a minute. Um, but everybody, everybody did it on their own. Um, there was some people who brought tents. <laughs> there was um, uh, one person was in a tent next to the refugee center um, in the in the in the snow because he didn't want to take a, a bed away from a refugee. Um, one person slept a couple nights in the train station. Um, on the floor because he didn't want to take a bench away from a refugee. Um, you know, you, you do what you can. Uh, that that's an extreme. Uh, sure. That that was in the earlier days of the of the uh, invasion. Um, for the glass fire for the fires, uh, they usually have a hotel, um, and uh, but you'll you'll pay your own way. Got it. Okay. So, but so your experience there and then led you to launch your own uh nonprofit mm -hmm. feed the world yeah. so let's talk a little bit about what feed the world does uh sure. what's your mission so my mission is to help these underserved communities in need all over the world and and the people who are who are helping them that was another thing that i learned there was all the volunteers that are over there so selflessly they're not getting a salary um people that i worked with two and a half years ago are still there they're still driving they're still driving, uh, you know, food, clothing, whatever is needed into Ukraine to help these remote villages, water. Um, one of the largest, uh, most requested items is wet wipes. Um, there's no running water, there's no heat. Um, so I raise money and I get it over and, and I make sure I know the people I work with. I know it gets directly to the people who need it. Um, and I, I've, I just returned from my 10th trip so I know these items are getting there. I see the items. I deliver. I go on the delivery runs. Um, in January, I went on a run. We were really close to the front lines. We were a few kilometers. In January, you could hear the shelling. Um, you know, we had full uh, full body armor, um, which was a little scary. But um, but that's not with World Central Kitchen. That's with another organization I went in with. Um, with World Central Kitchen in Ukraine, they only work with Ukrainians. Um, so my time going into Ukraine was on my own. 
and I've paid for that. And so um, with World Central Kitchen, I raise the money and then I, I send it in or I'll, um, or I'll bring it in and buy what's needed and get it to the people who need it. Okay, so, but as it relates to Feed the World, right? So you're an organization, you raise money to, you're helping by raising money and then being able to know that it's being spent in the right ways. Right, I know it's going directly to the people. There's no middleman, I don't take anything. Um, my people on the ground don't take anything, but I also raise money to help support some of the people that I work with. So these are the people that don't have a salary, they're there as full-time volunteers. Um, they all they do day and night is drive supplies in, evacuate people nonstop. And, and, and seeing that you realize that you need to help the helpers too. Okay. So I want, I'm curious just as we're talking about ripples of impact, right? Like, so the, the actions people can take. So you went from working for one, uh, volunteering with one organization to launching your own. And I'm curious how did you make the decision to sort of start your own thing rather than support an existing infrastructure, right? Because I think that that might be a question that comes up. Like I could start uh, something, but is there somebody already doing it, right? So what was sort of the thought process in on the path to making your own uh, uh, nonprofit? Sure. Um, part of it was, so um, in early 2022, when I started um, fundraising to work with my friend Holly, uh, supporting the refugees uh, as they came over early on, I, I had I I wanted to put up a GoFundMe, but I really hesitated. I hate asking for money. Now I have no problem, but back then I hated asking for money, and um and I and I I really hesitated to put up a GoFundMe. I thought, oh, no one's gonna no one's going to donate. I'll get fifty dollars. It's going to be embarrassing. And I thought, you know, just do it. You never know. And so I put up a put up my GoFundMe, sent it out to people I knew. And within a week I had $10,000 and wow. it just, it blew me away. And, and the amount of people that can be helped with that amount of money. I mean, the amount of people that can be helped with $20 is, is, is mind blowing $200. It's, um, and it just kept growing. And, and, and very soon it was up to 40,000 and, um, and so I thought I better make this a little more legal. <laughs> I don't want the IRS coming after me. So great. it was all through GoFundMe and I had receipts for everything. But um, but I wanted to keep this going because I saw I saw firsthand with my eyes how much it was helping people directly. It's not like writing a check to these huge uh, NGOs, um, Red Cross, those sorts of things um, where, you know, so much of it goes to overhead. You never know where it gets to. Um, I knew that the money I was raising, the money that I was putting in was going directly to people. It was going to clothes, food, water. It was, you know, paying for somebody's apartment for a week who, or a month who's been volunteering and they have, they didn't have that much coming in that month. Um, it was, I mean, I saw it was, it was directly helping people. And, um, and so that's why, that's why I would rather do my own little thing instead of, um, just give money to a big organization because I just, I see how far so little goes when it's a one-to-one -one impactful um, project. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about that because you, you brought up the, the refugee family earlier trying to make their way to Edinburgh. And mm -hmm. I, you know, when you said you were trying to raise money, I was thinking, you know, in my mind, I was like, Ooh, how many thousands of dollars? And you said like four to $500. I was like, Oh yeah. Well, that's not much. And that seemed no. to really make a huge difference. So can you give me some examples, some more examples of like, just how, just the sense of scale, right? Because we may think a, a problem is so massive, there's no way we can even begin to help with it. But what you're right. saying is that actually, small bits actually go a long way. Small bits go so far. And, and that's what I, I try, you know, in the US, we're so skewed. We have such a warped sense of of what things really cost, and 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 it's funny when I go into a a, a pharmacy uh, in Europe and Ukraine, the prices are half, less than half uh, there. So we really we're really skewed here. Um, but uh, for example, um, I'm about to launch an, for the third year in a row a wood burning stove campaign because on the eastern part of Ukraine there's no power, there's no electricity, there's no heat, there's no running water. So uh, 
these people can't even cook. And so for $200, um, a colleague of mine found this um, uh, manufacturer who makes these wood, makes these, uh, I don't know, they're about two, two feet high, wood burning stoves. They're really solid and they'll put a nameplate on. And so it's a great, uh, you know, donate a, snow, donate a stove in someone's name for Christmas, for the holidays, um, someone's birthday. Um, so they've got little name plates on them. And um, I, I, think, I think the last count we had, pretty much the, the Southeastern front line of Ukraine, we had given stoves every so, every so, every few miles there was a stove there and they were in trenches, they were in schools, they were in shelters, they were in homes. Um, one woman sent a video saying, thank you so much, we no longer have mushrooms growing on our walls mm. because it was so cold. Um, the soldiers love them because they say it's the fastest thing that dries their clothes, so they they um, they don't get gangrene. Um, I mean, they literally take these stoves into the trenches. I mean, it, it, when I was there in January, it was, 20 below Celsius. I mean, it is, it's cold. It's a cold yeah. that I think only people in upper, upper Michigan or upper Maine know. Um, but, uh, you know, so for $200, you save a family. You, yeah. um, I, I received pictures from, of a village and they had a couple of our stoves and the entire village was all the, all the Bob Keys were in under one tent making the uh, Varana Keys, the dumplings. And then in another tent, everybody in town was eating the Varenikis that they'd cooked on the stove. So we, you know, for $200, you've fed a village. Um, it's, it's remarkable. It, you, you can't even <laughs> describe it. Um, I have a mental health program. It just launched in uh, Mikolaev in the Southeast. And the child psychologist that I hired bought 10 jump ropes. You know, it was $50. And these kids have spent most of the summer, they're just, they're so bored. They have nothing to do. They're on their phones. They all think they're going to be TikTok famous. So they don't want to do anything. And, uh, and we brought these, she brought these jump ropes. And now the kids all day this week, every day, all day this week, they've been jumping rope and they can't wait. They run and find her and, and they say, Natalia, I jumped 120 times. And, and it gets these kids so excited and active and moving. Um, and so, you know, just a little bit, again, a little bit goes so far. Um, one of the people that I've worked with over the last two and a half years, he called me, this was about a year ago, year and a half ago and said, Laura, we supply food to this one shelter and we just had a hundred people show up. They have, uh, they're they've been in a bomb shelter for four months. Their clothes are in, are, are, are falling apart. Um, can you send money over? I said, sure. How much do you need? And and he said, $500. And I said, for a hundred outfits? And he said, yeah. And I sent the money over. I got the receipt. I got pictures of the clothes. And, you know, we gave clothes to 500 people. Um, I mean, a hundred people. It, it, it's 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 mind boggling what what you can do. So on that, all right. So what you can do, right? So people listening, people watching right now, what are the ways that they can start making their own ripples of impact in a way that uh, is, you know, actionable and attainable right now, right? Like, what are some things people can start doing today? Well, there's a there's a wonderful saying um, that Buddha has called, um, tend to the area of the garden that you can reach. So if you, your garden is this big, take care of this garden. If your garden's a little bit bigger, my garden's in Ukraine. <laughs> So um, I've got to fly over there, but w wherever your garden is, take care of it. Um, every, pretty much every city um, within a half an hour drive, there's probably a, a food bank, I'm guessing. Um, there's libraries, there's, there's ways, there's so many ways to help. Um, if, if you know somebody, I'm, uh, my, my, um, my mental health program at the orphanage just kicked off. I funded the first part of it and I've got to fund the next, uh, for the rest of the year now, we funded this this two week block. Now I've got to do the next two months. So, um, you know, find people who are doing one-to-one -one donating because that's really where you see the impact. Um, you know, I'm always sending updates to the people who donate. Here's where your money went. And and they'll they'll make videos and I'll send it to the people. So they see, so they see where their money goes. Um, 
And so there's so many ways that that you can help um, show up at, at if, if there's a natural disaster, as soon as you can get over there, get over there. Um, usually restaurants, the first thing you'll see, I always say um, cooks, uh, chefs, Chefs, the first thing you see is chefs are in there cooking for people. It's just, it's who we are. <laughs> we just want to cook for people. We want to feed people. We want to nurture people, love people. Um, and so, uh, you know, whenever there's been a fire up here in Northern California, first thing you see, as soon as the restaurants can, they're up there and cooking. And so if you can jump into a restaurant and volunteer, I mean, they always need prep cooks. They need people getting food. Um, there's so many ways. And, you know, we're sort of in this, oh, I'll send a check, I'll send a check. But, um, and that's wonderful because it does take money to make these things run. You can't do it without money, bottom line, but um, it doesn't take a lot of money. And if you actually show up and, and do it, it's so much more impactful. So I encourage everyone to um, create their own uh, ripple of impact. You know, we're so used to this ROI of uh, what's your return on investment? What's, what's in it for me? But if we think about it, our ripples of impact, taking it out and how such a small thing um, can really, really change the world. Uh, there was a family who was in an apartment next to me in Poland for two nights. Uh, they're from Zaporizhia where the nuclear power plant is in Ukraine. And um, I heard the older kid, he, he cried nonstop. And I, just, I said, how can I help you? And the father, I said, where are you going? Where are you going? What are you going to do? father said, I, I have no idea. I don't know. I, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. And I said, okay, we'll get you an apartment for a month. Um, we'll get outside of town. The kids can um, reset their, you know, reset their nervous system and you can figure out what's next. And um, I ended up helping them relocate to Amsterdam. And the oldest son now is, is one of the top um, martial arts kids in the country he's winning tournaments all across the country and this mm. is all in two years um and so you know that one month in the apartment that cost me one thousand dollars um it was a house uh, about an hour outside of town it changed their lives and now this kid is excelling like you would never believe um and, and so those sorts of things um you know it's so easy to help. We just have to sort of get out of our head and, and get outside the box. Um, but usually if there's a natural disaster, there's going to be people who need help. And if you just show up with water bottles and, um, and, and box of sandwiches, <laughs> that would help. All right. Well, if people wanted to find out more about Feed the World, where should they go? So it's a little complicated because I don't have a website up yet. Um, but I can send it to you. Um, if you Google feed the world, uh, it should come up, but I'm, uh, it's under my chef's website, my cooking website, which is Cucina Testarossa. Um, but I will be getting a website up one of these days. If anybody out there is a web person, if you want to help me put it up, I would be forever grateful. But, um, in the meantime, if you look up Cucina Testarossa, it's, uh, on there. And I suppose they can connect with you on LinkedIn to find out more. Yeah. I'm on LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Instagram, all those, all those places. I refuse to get on TikTok, but I think I might have to. <laughs> I've, been, I've been resisting it, but uh, I might just have to, uh, might have to do it. Well, Laura, Polly, thank you so much for sharing your journey and tips on making ripples of impact uh, from wherever you are. You are the founder of Feed the World, and you've done a lot of great stuff for this world. So thank you so much for that. And thank you for being a guest on our show. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an honor.